Hi everyone, and welcome back to episode 30 of the All Things Interesting podcast. It's been an incredible journey so far, and I first off wanted to say thank you for all of my listeners out there for supporting the show and making it what it is today, so thank you. For episode 30, my partner, Jennifer Love, joins the show for a three-part special series with her former professor of human development and family studies at Penn State, Dr. Molly Suzanne Countermine, to talk about the profound areas of human development. On part one of the series, we take a look at what human development and family studies is, a holistic look at upbringing, genetics, and temperament, the intersection with psychology, as well as a societal look into individualism, community building, and the incredibly fascinating area of attachment theory and empathy. So with that said, enjoy the first part of this incredible series with our guest, Dr. Countermine. bit of a different show though because I would say this is the first time I'm having a co-host or Definitely a guest on the first time yeah <laughs> I mean you've heard my podcasts yeah uh, but you've never been involved uh, so I wanted to include Jennifer my girlfriend because Hello. she Hello. has been one of your students yes. while at Penn State and I think it would be pretty awesome to have uh, that third person here to provide some of that perspective Absolutely. and provide their own thoughts on what you do. So cool. welcome to the show, Jen. Glad to have you Thank here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm honored. Aww. So really, I wanted to kind of start at the beginning here because you are a associate teaching professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. And that was my minor. <laughs> and <laughs> When I was going to the U of A, I know there was a program, it was like a very similar program uh, that they had there, but I never really understood personally what it was or what was being taught in that program. Mm -hmm. So just to start here, can you give like an overview of what it is that human development and family studies is? Sure. So this, in simplest terms, I often like to say to my students who, um, often come to my classroom uh, simply because like they've been referred by a friend like oh you got to take Molly's class and they don't know definitely, what it, definitely. They, they don't know what it is human development and family studies so I always start off by saying if if psychology and sociology had a baby it would be human development and family studies mm. because human development and family studies takes the idea of individual development that you would really learn in psychology and plants it in context. So the context of family, the context of friends, the context of schools, community, culture. So we look at how those different contexts influence individual development. And if you right. can hear my dog snoring, it's because he's literally at my feet. <laughs> I, I, th I thought that was a car <laughs> outside. <laughs> it's like, is the band practice, practicing? Is that the bass? <laughs> it's so cute. That's hilarious. It. Yeah, just, just so you know, that's Sam. <laughs> no, we're, we're all good. We have our, our little fluffer yeah, under the some, desk. Yeah, under somewhere. the desk. She doesn't yeah. snore like that, but yeah. <laughs> um, so it just sounds like human development is more of a broad form of psychology where instead of focusing on the individual mind you are expanding out on that to i guess multiple people larger groups such as a family such as communities such as i guess whole cultures of different yes. countries right okay well absolutely but we also study individuals but we don't we can't you, we recognize that you can't take them out of context so if we were studying individuals, which we do, we would also want to know, you know, where did they grow up? What, mm -hmm. what did their family system look like? Uh, did they have siblings? What, what socioeconomic status were they in? Um, what's their race? What's their gender? You know, where did they go to school? 
Mm-hmm. Kind of like all, all the other things. factors yeah. that create a person. You know, you yep. can't just have yep. this is this is the person. There's so many mm-hmm. influences. So right. it, yep. it's making sure that we learn about how all of those things create that person. Right. While also recognizing that each individual has their own unique set of characteristics that they bring to the table. And and a good example of that is why um, siblings will often have very different experiences in their homes and why siblings often turn out very different because they, even though they might have had the same family and the same schools and the same neighborhood, community, et cetera, you know, they have their own temperament. They um, have their own way of reacting to the environment, their own preferences. Then they select their own experiences as in terms of friends, in terms of what clubs they join, what activities they do, that kind of thing. So are you saying that even before the influence of nature versus nurture, there is an underlying temperament that a child has that is, I guess, that evolves. So the temperament, yeah, the temperament is the nature. That's that's one of the big parts that we would say is nature, is is the temperament. And how does the, so how does the temperament, um, what, what does that look like? Like how does yeah. that, um, influence how the kids um, when they're young will perceive those experiences. So one really easy way to illustrate it is um, to think about um, whether or not a a kid really loves new things, like they love to try new foods, they love to try new experiences, they love to meet new people, they're not afraid to ride rides at the um, amusement park. They they run into school on the first day, or are they um, more hesitant, more cautious? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we even see that in in grownups, right? That some people like the their things to be the same, and some people really seek out change. And and we also see, you know, I, I um, often illustrate it like this: Do you have if you think about your friend group, there is probably somebody in that group that is like, when when you tell a joke, they they laugh hysterically and they and they they start you know their tears rolling down their face. And you have That's another Tesh. friend, <laughs> <laughs> and then so Tesh will appreciate this. Tesh, do you have a friend that when you tell a really funny joke, they're like, "That's funny." Yeah. Right, and that's like, kind of more me and then, yeah, we and we're literally looking at each other like, oh, oh yep, we know yeah, exactly yeah, who that is. Yeah, right. So, so it's like we call that like intensity of reaction. So I'm more like Tesh. My husband Renee is more like you. So it's like, uh, you know, somewhere in between, you have to find common ground. But you could see how you know, people's perceptions and reactions would be totally different based on that own internal thing, which is where I feel comfortable operating. And we don't even know that. Like, you know, I think at the beginning of of some of the classes that I teach, students never even realize, oh, like that's, yeah, I've, I've always been like that. Or oh, every yeah. single that's one of I your classes, that, yeah. I mean, not just the, be- the beginning. I remember like almost every class I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, personally, I always feel like whenever someone asks like why I do something or how, why do I respond a certain way, I always say, well, that's how I've always been. I never really understand or I'm able to distinguish between, oh, I was born like this as right. opposed to, well, my external influences such as how I was raised or the people I surrounded myself with or things that happened in my life made me that way. I always think to myself, well, I was born this way. That's inherently just it my is. personality. Yes, yes. And <laughs> and we can recognize that there are aspects of our temperament that we might want to tweak in some way. Um, I, I am a very anxious person, and I always have been. So I have always um, tried to work on what I can do to manage that better 
rather than just saying, well, I'm an anxious person and that's the way it's always going to be. Or, and so you would say that anxiety is more developed from your temperament absolutely, rather than really? different earlier childhood experiences? It's So here's the cool thing. It's both. But what okay. happens, and Jen, maybe you remember this, you know, when we talked about attachment and temperament and how yeah. when when a kid, when a baby is um, has that anxious, you know, temperament um, early on, they're really hard to parent, right? Mm-hmm. They cry a lot. They, they require so much more um, parental intervention when it comes to um, you know, leaving them or getting them to meet new people or try new things. And so what happens is if they don't have a parent who's really patient and really sensitive and, and, um, gives them time to warm up to things, then they begin to feel like an internal shame about that. And, and it makes and that shame makes them even more anxious. So what we are learning is that early parenting, and I think this is what Tesh was sort of looking at, is you know that that it's both because if early parenting can help curb some of those really um, strong tendencies, then then you can end up not as anxious as you were when you were a kid. But you will still be a little bit anxious because that's your temperament, but not as anxious. That makes sense. Yeah. A way, like when I spoke to a psychologist before and I I asked them this question Mm -hmm. um, in a separate interview, I was bringing up anxiety and the way they typically look at it is that if someone has anxiety, it's derived from some event that happened early in their childhood, uh, opposed to saying that it could have been a temperament that they were born with. So I'm, I'm wondering, is there much, I guess, cross communication between the fields of psychology and human development? Because it seems like, like both, in the research, yeah, right. because it seems like both have different opinions. Where, where as psychology says, well, it's purely based off an event that occurs in a child's life. Human development says, well, it's a combination of human development hmm. and... Right, yeah. So there is. there. So human development itself is very multidisciplinary. Um, for example, like on my dissertation committee, I had a, a woman who was a professor of psychology. So I do believe that we, um, that, that the, the two hands are talking to each other, so to speak. But what... What I think is that there is so much research that it's sometimes hard to figure out which one is the best to pay attention to. So the really good studies are going to measure lots of different variables, but also measure lots of different people, and they're going to follow them longitudinally. And I think what the psychologist was probably thinking was that a lot of anxiety could stem from something like PTSD, which we think of PTSD as like associated with, you know, if you were um, in the military and you had this really traumatic event happen, or you were you know, you had this really traumatic event happen in some in some form of abuse or assault uh, in your life. And what we're learning is that PTSD is um, really, it can even be in response to what we would consider like chronic stress, not an acute stress. So acute meaning it happened one time and then it wasn't anymore. And it was like a huge, crazy event. Right. But you know it could right. be right, like, like a car accident or a, right. or an assault or you know something of that nature. Um, but when so here's the thing: if we go back to this idea that like temperamentally difficult babies are harder to parent, then when we think about what their infancy might have been like, it would be 
potentially loaded with chronic stress, you know, not being treated sensitively when they're crying, um, not being uh, held when they felt like they needed to be held, not being um, treated like in a, with patience and with, you know, instead of like the, you're fine, you know, <laughs> get your pick pick yourself up, rub some <laughs> dirt in it, like that kind of thing. And I could right. even not... be like not being changed right away, you know, like, oh, their diaper's wet, but like we can wait another hour, like stuff like that. I mean, especially if the baby was like full pitch crying that whole time. Mm-hmm. So let's imagine a baby and they are, you know, five months old. Do either of you remember anything from being five months old? The answer is um, typically no. No. Right? No. We, we don't have, all right. Yeah. Maybe I think six it's safe years old say, is like the earliest. Yeah, exactly. So, so imagine that that baby has a tendency to cry a lot. And there's a lot of babies that have a tendency to cry a lot. And the parents have been told by their parents and their grandparents and their neighbor and, you know, that, oh, let them cry it out because we don't, you don't want to spoil them. You don't want to get them used to being held, you know, whenever they want to be held. And and then my other favorite is because they're going to start manipulating you, right? Mm. At five months old. At five months old. (laughs) So I'm not saying that any one of those events were so traumatic that they would be considered like this acute traumatic event. I'm saying the accumulation of a lot of, um, you know, not being nurtured in a way that your temperament needed Mm. to be nurtured. And, you know, again, I will, I'll point to studies from anthropology um, studies, ethnographic studies of populations that are still like in the developing world Mm -hmm. or studies of primates, which we are, Mm -hmm. we are the only primates that really expect a pretty significant level of independence from infants. Never thought about that. That's true. And what do you mean? So you know, let's think about the way a typical house in the United States is set up when they're expecting a new baby. They, they designate a room to be the nursery. The crib is separate from the parents' room. Uh, there's a monitor. Um, and, and really from some of the first nights of the baby's life, they slight, they sleep separately from their parents and, and they, you know, they wake up and they cry and the parents get up and get out of bed and they come over and they tend to the infant's need. Um, I'm, I always say to my students, and now imagine that we're in the jungle and we're looking at a group of chimps or orangutans or gorillas. Now, can you imagine in the first couple of months of life, um, the, the, the mama chimp, taking her infant and making a little nest behind a tree. <laughs> and tucking her into the leaves. Tucking them into the leaves, <laughs> saying, kissing them goodnight, and then going two trees over and falling asleep. That's crazy. Wait, like, does, that, does that happen though? No, it doesn't. Okay, so I was like, aren't they overly protective of their newborns? Yeah, right. that's the point that Molly's making is that like, we do that, even and though it's in a difference. house and a crib. Right. But right. why? Right. <laughs> right, and here's why, because we're, we're a really individualistic culture that pushes independence as um, a goal. And we think that we need to push that from the beginning of life, right? So the thing is, is that I think that, you know, when we think, why would a parent do that? Well, that's the way it's done, right? That's because that's the way it's done. That's what our culture tells us to do. And the parent knows that the baby's okay, right? Mm-hmm. The parent yeah. knows that the baby's fed and clean, warm, 
And then I always ask my students, does the baby know? Whoa. No, so, there's so, no way of the baby knowing. So, so what do we want to teach the baby? Do we want to teach safe. the baby that other people are safe and that the world is safe and that other people care for you and that you are, uh, when you need something, someone will be there? Or do we really think that it's smart from that early of an age to push? You're going to learn to self-soothe. You're going to learn to take care of yourself. You're going to learn to not depend on other people. You're going to learn that you're the only one you can depend on. Isn't that a self-perpetuating flaw of society then? If yeah. we teach our children to just be completely independent and not to sort of build a community centric mindset and try to. Before guess, they have to learn how to be independent. Exactly. Right. right. I mean, I often think, and I'm sure Jen remembers me saying this in class. I often think that maybe some of the biggest problems in our society come from not feeling like others are safe and, and yeah, Remember, remember the, that I, I often say attachment. So that's what's being formed is the attachment yeah. relationship, right? Before we go into that yeah, attachment yeah. relationship, because I, I knew we were going to go there because it's so mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Just looking at the temperament again, mm -hmm. like from birth. Yeah. Does, is there anything that, you know, because I've heard, you know, well, if you're an anxious mom while you're pregnant, then your baby's temperament is going to be more anxious. Is that... Is that true, I guess? Like, do they see that temperament yeah. can come from, you know, what the prenatal vitamins or what the mom is doing? Or is it really just kind of a genetic DNA thing? Well, so it's certainly not because of prenatal vitamins, but although, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> although, no, no, but prenatal care is really important. But here's the thing. If it's genetic, which we think it is, right, then it's coming from mom anyway and dad. True. Now, what we do know clearly is that when a mother is very stressed out during her pregnancy, she is more likely to have a baby with a difficult temperament, meaning, um, you know, fussy and, and, and difficult to soothe and much more um, intense. Um, because what happens when a person's stressed, we get cortisol, we get adrenaline and anything that's going into mom's system is going into the baby system. And it's not just an emotional, mental anxiety, like anxiety no. is a physical thing. You know, yeah, absolutely. You, you can feel the stress in your neck and yep. your back. Yep. And is, is that why when families say they have a predisposition or history of depression or any other mental disorder, it's typically because it's passed through the mother who is experiencing those, Or the I guess, father. Or, because I mean, the father's genes, so the father's genetics would contribute to it. But then, yes, that also the prenatal environment. So I would say it's, it's both, right? I don't, I, we would not be able to say, oh, it's going to be 50% this or 50% that. Um, it's it's going to be both because it also depends then on what the parents are doing in order to reduce mom's level of stress during the pregnancy. It sounds like it's very systemic in that it mm -hmm. keeps getting passed along from generation mm -hmm. to generation. But mm -hmm. if the parents, while waiting those nine months, prior to birth, if they kind of curate their life to be more or well, less anxious or so, yeah. you're saying that you can give your child more of a chance to be less anxious, exactly. but they still might have anxiety, but it won't be as bad. Right. You, you certainly can, but that also doesn't mean the chances are zero. Mm -hmm. If that, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you essentially want to, um, lay the best foundation that you can. Now, don't get me started. We don't make it very easy for parents in this country. Yeah. Not not prenatally and not in the first year of the infant's life either. You know, there's our our 
parental leave is a joke. You know, it's it's uh, the Family Medical Leave Act. You get three months pay unpaid if you work for full time for a company that with 50 or more employees and you've accrued your vacation days on top of that and you can afford to not be paid for three months. Mm -hmm. So you work you work right up to the end of your pregnancy. Yep. And then you have three months off. Even if you're if in bed rest, you know, you're working remotely. So there's that added stress even yeah. from that. Yeah. So it's like it's like on a societal level, there's even challenges. Yeah. It's not just when perpetuating she needs, the individuality. Don't get her started. She, yeah. I remember <laughs> I re Molly, I was telling you this um on the side that your class in college was like one of the only ones that I was like, oh wow. I'm learning college. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> so I remember yeah. way too many. And I know when you say, don't get you started, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> she, we're picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's it, to give you like a framework of what we know about around 40% of babies in the United States, that number could be a little lower. Are, are what we would consider easy. So, you know, you've seen these babies at a restaurant when they're just, they're little babies, but they're just sitting there and they're smiling and they're happy and they're being passed around from person to person and they're not crying. And, and just like, you know, you know me and Tash, perfect babies. <laughs> <laughs> and we're exactly. sliding into the attachment theory now, correct? <laughs> well, that's, that's still temperament, right? Okay. Because this Because this baby is like, just chill, yeah. right? They're just this easy chill. peasy lemon squeeze. Sounds like me as a child. And they're so easy to parent. Like they're just and and if you talk to a parent who's had an easy baby and then another who wasn't, they will tell you that parenting them is like night and day. And mm. and I Jen will probably also remember I didn't have any easy babies. So yeah, I do remember you saying that, you know, um, there is both depression and anxiety on both mine and Renee's size of the family. And I was in graduate school and we're both musicians and I'm gigging and stress doesn't have to feel like awful. Like I, right. you know, when, when I'm thinking about gigging and being up late, that's also putting my body in stress, even though it's fun. Right. Well, so, and it's not to say also that because you were doing that, like this 100% cause no, exactly. your kids no. to be a more no. um, difficult right. temperament baby, right. no. but that that's just kind of what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we just dealt with it. You know, I, I, we spent a lot of nights passing a baby back and forth so that the baby could still be held and not crying and knowing that someone was there right you know and it and it paid off what about a situation in which you mentioned that a child's temperament might be genetic to a degree but when you have it being passed down from generation to generation even after the child is born they're being raised in a situation in which their parents are actively being affected by anxiety or depression for example and we know nurture is a big influence on yeah this is person. attachment theory i think right <laughs> yes, I don't, I don't know, yes. maybe yes, <laughs> yes. yes. So, uh, so i'm curious <laughs> like a big influence is prior to birth but like even after birth there was a here we go the good stuff and absorption yeah. of attachment theory so i'm just gonna let you jump into <laughs> <Yeah>. that then <laughs> so here's the thing is that our attachment <laughs> is established by the time we're two. Now, again, <laughs> I always say, do you have any memories prior to that? And most kids don't, Not really. you know, most students don't, most people don't have a memory. We see a clear pattern of attachment emerges at one year and, and is pretty stable if we measure it again at two years, unless we do some sort of an intervention with the parents to make them more sensitive as parents. Can you and define 
attachment, like like just a quick kind of definition yeah. of like what attachment, attachment theory is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just for listeners. So attachment is the strong, intense emotional bond that forms between an infant and their primary caregivers uh, in the first year to two years of life. And it becomes this template that we view our relationships through as we then move on to relationships with friends, with romantic partners, with others. And it's a parallel model, which means on the one hand, it's about um, how I expect to be treated by others. But on the other hand, um, it's about uh, whether or not I'm worthy of being treated well. So kind of like your self-esteem a little bit? To, yeah, to some degree, although I, I think um, it's, it's you can feel good about yourself in other aspects of your life. You can feel, you know, I'm a good student, um, I'm a good um, basketball player, you know, I'm a good artist, whatever. But when it comes to relationships, um, you know, there's a great line from that movie, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, mm-hmm. We we expect the love we think we deserve. Yeah. And the thing about attachment is we don't even understand why that is. Like, why would I, why would I pick these people who don't really seem to love me or, um, you know, where I, I don't feel like they want to connect with me or I, um, I'm constantly feeling insecure about their um, their feelings for me. And then I put up with, you know, that they're, they don't even treat me that well, or they uh, ignore me, or they make fun of my needing reassurance or whatever, whatever the case may be. Yeah, you don't even realize that you that's don't. the way you're mm-hmm. acting. Like, I'm, I mean, before I met Tesh, obviously not now, but it's, yeah. well, they're too good for me. Mm -hmm. And you don't really think about why you ever feel that way or you'll base it on, well, they're, oh, they're smarter than me or this or that. But what you're saying is it's a lot deeper than that. It it starts at an earlier age. And that's why I don't get it. See, and the thing too is it's pre-memory, right? It's pre-memory. It's pre, you don't remember any of that. But it's established. Okay, so here's the thing. (laughs) So he needs about, your classes, Molly. Come on. <laughs> he does. Well, I'm writing a book and that'll be done in December. So we'll just get him a copy yes. of that. Um, he, so when we think about the brain and we think about the pruning of the brain, and I'm sure Tesh, you've, you've, you know, you're aware of like when, when we learn something, neural pathways, you know, are created and, um, mm-hmm. All right. So what a lot of people don't realize is that the vast majority of the pruning that happens in our brains happens. And pruning being by the like if those four. pathways are being um, disconnected. No, no. So we're basically born with um, with these brains. Our big cortex is like not wired yet. Oh, so okay. It, it gets wired, and imagine that these are phone lines that gets stronger and stronger every time somebody uh, makes that call, right? So, right, okay. So, and, and then the, the neurons around that phone line that aren't needed, they die. And that's what pruning is. And it's a good thing that brain prunes so that we have these efficient pathways in our brains that, that help us learn language and that help us, um, you know, interpret vision and and all this and the vast majority of it is done by the time we're four and that freaks people out because they first of all they don't believe it because they're like i'm so much i have so much more knowledge in my brain than i had when i was four but that's not part of the pruning process that's like um that's like higher level reasoning and i mean i'm not a neurologist so i don't get all the the nuances of that. What I know is in terms of the limbic system, which is the, the kind of fight or flight emotional brain, that is very much being pruned in the first year of life. And And kind of like the foundations 
of how to learn and how to gain uh -huh. more knowledge exactly. Exactly. rather than, you know, the, the specifics right. of it, but just those right. foundations. Right. right. I yeah. think that's crazy, though, because if you think yeah. about it, no one really has an idea of what they're doing when they have a child. It's not like mm -hmm. they've experienced it before. Yeah. So I'm I just know. thinking to myself, well, it's so a, much pressure. It's, now. A, it, it's a lot of pressure, yeah. pressure and it's a scary yeah. thought thinking, well, I have these two to four years to define my child mm -hmm. as a human being. <laughs> right. And then they'll go to school and, and then they'll go into therapy, right? And and, and everything will get fixed. <laughs> Everyone point, should right? go to therapy. That's How about it? My plug. But, <laughs> so here's the thing is we think we don't have a clue. And yet we have this sort of innate sense of when a baby cries, I need to pick it up. When a baby is hurt or, or, you know, in some way signaling to me that they need me, then every fiber in my being feels compelled to go get the baby. And that we see, this is what's really interesting, Tesh, is that we see that not only in just in parents, we see that in people that don't have kids. So if you've ever been at the store and you hear a baby crying and you're like, oh my God, would someone make that baby stop crying? <laughs> that's, that's your innate parental thing saying that baby needs someone to take care of it. And the thing is, cultures other than ours you know, uh, uh, let's say there's a lot of Westernized cultures, but other cultures and some 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 Westernized cultures that that are still a little bit less Westernized than us have this idea of independence and individualism, and I've got to do this all by myself. So we've stopped some of the um, the generational support and transmission of how to raise a baby, and even what we're passing along now is is stuff that was like, you know, from a hundred years ago, which said stuff like, try not to hold the baby too much and 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 when possible, shake their hands and give them a pat on the head. And I mean, the behaviorists thought for sure that we could just take any baby and mold it into whatever we wanted to and that the way to do that was to treat them like a little adult. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like, <laughs> obviously problematic. Um, but other cultures that are, that are more, you know, um, so collectivist where they're mm -hmm. community oriented or they're even developing, you know, it, more hunter gatherer, what do they do? I mean, it, the, the, that slogan, it takes a village to raise a child that was popularized mm -hmm. in the nineties. It really does. I mean, and villages would together raise the infants and and an infant was always strapped to someone's back until they were able to sit by themselves with a, an older sibling near a group of people. And even then they were probably only sitting away from people, you know, with another, with a couple of kids or whatever for a little bit of time. And then they got back on moms, typically moms back, but maybe an aunt, maybe a grandmother, mm -hmm. maybe an older sibling, much older sibling. And, and that, so, you know, when, when, when ethnographers ask other cultures about, you know, like babies crying or what you do when a baby cries, they're actually in some ways sort of confused about that question because Babies don't really cry when all they're doing is being held most of the time. Yeah. It's like if they're crying because they need something. Right. So are you, or in your opinion, this was one of Tesher's like really big questions. Is there mm -hmm. kind of a clear cut way? Like there really is kind of a right or wrong way to raise a child? Uh, it, it, there's not. Um, 
there's no easy, I think the, the, the safest way to answer that question is to say, if you're a sensitive parent and you're patient and you sort of follow your child's lead, your, your baby's lead, because we're not talking about, you know, the, the two and a half year old who's having a tantrum in the grocery store aisle because they want the cereal. We're talking mm-hmm. about the two month old who's crying or the nine month old who's crying. But in some ways we're even, we, we, we could extend that to the two and a half year old because what you wouldn't want to do as a parent at any point is be insensitive and, and, um, you know, um, saying, look at you, why are you crying? Could you just stop crying? Nobody else is crying. Why are you, you know, and, and really shaming the child into feeling guilty for wanting that cereal or that toy or, or to not go to daycare or to not be left at, you know, the grandparents' house to be sensitive about that and to explain what's happening. And, oh, I see you really love the cereal. Yeah. I wish we could all live on, you know, Cocoa Krispies. And <laughs> Only the but marshmallows so, from the Lucky Charms. Yeah. But that's a thing. And, I, think that, I think that's a really big challenge, though, because it's huge. The, pa- it's the, huge. The, pa- the parent could be really sensitive to the situation, but mm-hmm. there's a much broader influence on children as they grow up. If you look Is at it, like when it wears that line where it's like tough love versus sensitivity, or not even that. Like I think the where I'm coming from with this is that a child is raised around technology. So if they're watching TV and they see a commercial of mm-hmm. cereal or whatever it may be, yeah, which has the greater influence, the television saying you should get this for your kid, like the cereal, or the mm-hmm. parent being able to be sensitive to the situation, but not buying into it. I, I think it's about, yeah, kids are going to be exposed to, to all of those images on the media. And we know they work, right? We know that kids ask for what they see on TV. That's been studied and, um, the, the parent ultimately is in control because they're either going to buy the cereal or they're not. And that doesn't mean they're going to stop the kid from having a tantrum. But what that does mean is if they are consistent and sensitive every time that kid asks for it and, you know, if they tantrum. So the message in a tantrum is I'm going to cry until you give in right? And the, the message that the parent has to send back is, I love you, and I'm not going to give in. Right. Here's a follow-up question to that. Mm-hmm. You mentioned earlier that a, and a parent or an adult inherently knows to pick up a baby when it's crying, or if they're in a grocery <laughs> right. store, they know, oh, someone needs to quiet that child. But does a human being inherently know how to do so in a situation like you're explaining where the right. child no. says, I want the cereal, a parent's not going to just say, oh, I know how to handle that situation inherently. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The I think where the instinct ends is with the crying of a newborn, you know, of a little, an infant. Um, I think, in fact, that it's actually more instinctual to get angry at that toddler that's tantruming. It's, Especially it's, if you're not understanding why it's so important to handle it a certain way. Yeah, you know? it's hard. I say, I think Jen's heard me say this, it's not rocket science, but it's not easy. Right. It's no, not, it's definitely... it, it, I can I can very simply say, um, you know, I, and I actually do say this to my students a lot, grow yourself up and calm yourself down because you're the only one who can. I didn't remember that, but I remember it now. And that's a, that's a good one. Grow, grow yourself. yourself up and calm yourself down because, because you're, you're the only one. one you can. Like as an adult, we, yeah. we know how to, well, I can't, I don't say every adult, you know, but right. as <laughs> an adult, we should be capable of calming down. Right. not expecting our kid to know how to do that themselves. Exactly. So as yep. a parent, we need to be the ones 
to help them learn how to calm themselves down. And that's, right. Molly, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of where you're saying that's where in those situations, if there's a tantrum, don't necessarily be ashamed of yourself or embarrassed that there's a tantrum because it's important to take the exactly. time to explain to your child, yeah. look, I, I totally understand that you want this. It looks delicious. The yeah. box is purple and sparkly, yeah. Yeah. but it's not healthy for you. And, right. you know, I'm saying no, and I know that upsets yeah. you, but that's not, yeah. that it's not a choice right now. And I'm sorry. And if they keep crying, it's not shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. It's exactly. well, that's, if you're going to be crying, that's okay. But, yep. and I love you, yep. and but that's I'll, just and what I'll, it is. Yep. And I'll hold you through it or, you know, or, uh, if you're going to squirm then I'm, I'll let you lay down on the ground right here and just yeah. have at it. Until and that doesn't make you done. a bad parent. You know, someone's going to walk by and like, oh my gosh, you're just letting your kids scream exactly. on the floor. It's like, right. well, if you know that you love your child and you're doing that so that they're understanding that they can't just throw a temper tantrum to get whatever they want, you know right. yourself that you're doing what needs to be done. And so right. there's, you know, then we talk about the whole, all the pressure from everyone right. else and mom right. shaming and blah, 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 right. blah. Exactly. But. And they'll, they eventually learn. So they'll eventually learn not to tantrum eventually. Right. And that's right? that consistency. I was looking through an old notebook yep. and I had consistency <laughs> written down yep. everywhere. Yep. And then I, mm -hmm. I actually, um, just a little plug about me and how much you inspired me, but I went from minor HDFS thinking I was going to be CSD and then HDFS human development, family studies, and then going to be a speech language pathologist life happened. Mm -hmm. Um, I ended up working um, in a with a company who works with kids who has autism, who have autism, mm -hmm. and kind of ABA and just learning about behavior. And I got a master's of education in behavior. Nice. So that consistency thing yep. is huge, huge. and it, it's not to say like you are super strict. It's just saying right. that. And that's, you know, when I think about, sorry, I'm, I'm blobbering on a little bit, but no, looking back even to, you know, trying to sleep train your kid and like, oh, just let them cry, let them cry, let them cry. Well, when they're a baby, not necessarily, but it, it relates to that, you know, tantrum when they're two or three. Uh, right. Yes. In that case, once you've explained the situation, then it is important to let them cry, let them cry, not just give in to the cereal because exactly. that's something they can understand. But when right. they're a baby, they don't. No, nope. right. They don't. That's a perfect example. And, you know, the inconsistency is what causes the problem. If sometimes you give in and sometimes, but sometimes you don't, you know, then, then what will keep testing you. Yeah. yeah. They'll, I, the, the message is, okay, I just haven't cried long enough yet. She'll give in. <laughs> and they're not consciously thinking this, no. you know, that's where I know when you were talking about like, Oh, well, the, your child's manipulating, you No, they're not thinking consciously. Ooh, no. I know if I cry longer, mom or dad's going <laughs> to give in. It's not right. a, it's not a conscious thing. It's just, no. and that's where, you know, the behavior, like you're just um, conditioned behavior of, Right. You, you don't realize it, but that pattern of, well, there's hope, you know, yeah. sometimes right. I cry and I get it. Sometimes I cry and I don't, but I've gotten it before. So right. there's hope. Yep. Well, just keep but again, crying. the child's not thinking about it consciously. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One question that comes to mind though, in all of this is it seems like you a parent needs to be really empathetic about the situation mm -hmm. when they're talking to the child saying, I understand why you want X, Y, and Z, but you can't mm -hmm. have it. Mm -hmm. So where does the empathy really derive from in all of this? Is, is it can someone you learn it? Yeah, is empathy learned or is it something that every person is born with, but it could shift to apathy based off the influences when a child is growing up? Such a great question. What it'll probably blow your mind <laughs> to know we're ready the, for it. <laughs> that the the biggest predictor of your attachment status is your parents attachment status to their parents so surprising but not surprising so what we know is 
empathy is learned by being empathized with. So if somebody shows me empathy, I learn empathy. Does that make sense? But what if they don't? Like how, because there are some people oh, yeah. who, you know, their parents were definitely not empathetic, but they themselves become an empathetic person. Well, so how I, does that work? So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously those people have probably done, you know, some work in terms of therapy and in terms of reading and and self-help but we also know that there's just innately different levels of empathy and and I, I this is not my what i'm about to say isn't my area of expertise but i know about the fact that in terms of somebody who's a sociopath what one of the ways that that's defined is a lack of remorse and a lack of guilt and a lack of empathy, like this inability, like an actual physiological inability to feel what another person is feeling. And sociopaths learn fairly early on. We think it's probably in like middle to late childhood, between like six and 10 years old, they learn, oh, wait a minute, other people feel bad when they accidentally hurt someone or when they intentionally hurt someone or when they see someone being hurt by someone else. And I don't. And is that a, a genetic thing then? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. and is I it think also it, based uh, on, you said like the parents' attachment? So it's probably both. It's probably both. Uh, this is this is the thing that we're gonna, I think, see a lot more research being done on over the next few years because empathy and compassion are becoming such hot topics in yeah. human development and psychology and sociology. Um, but, uh, I mean, the last I read, which was probably a couple of years ago, there are interventions that can increase empathy. And um, a great program to check out is, uh, it's called Roots of Empathy. Uh, it was founded by a woman named Mary Gordon in Canada. And they teach, you'll, you'll love this, Jen, they teach empathy to K through seven, seventh graders. Yes. By bringing babies and their parents into classrooms and teaching them about the attachment relationship. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Social emotional learning, yes. Exactly, <laughs> and, they, and they watch and each classroom gets a baby and a parent and that's their baby. And they watch this baby from three months to nine months grow in front of their eyes with their parents. And it's this beautiful program that talks about, look at the baby, um, nonverbal, because empathy is like this nonverbal thing, right? We yeah, see it's like a feeling kind of. Right. So we watch this nonverbal baby communicating with their parent. And then also some of the, you know, other people in the classroom and, and the, you know, researchers are very well trained in how the protocol of the program goes. They, they ask the, the students in the classroom to put themselves in the position of the baby, put themselves in the position of the parent. What do you think the baby wants right now? What do you think the baby's feeling? What do you think the parent's feeling? You know, and they learn empathy it it that's this so program, cool this program works so well it was it was originally adopted by by certain school systems in an in a in an effort to um, decrease bullying so mm -hmm. an anti anti-bullying but what they found was not only does it decrease bullying but it increases altruistic and pro-social behavior in classrooms yeah. as well so well, I mean, not only are they not being mean to each other, but they're also actually being much nicer to yeah. each other. 
Well, and you don't even, it, it, it doesn't even seem like it would be something that you're like explicitly having to, to teach something, you know, here's the vocabulary words. It's really just, again, just kind of a mindset and interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me just kind of, you know, by observing the empathy, you kind of can become more empathetic. But yeah. <laughs> there's a TikTok challenge out there where oh. it's like, um, <laughs> parent like cuddle with a toddler you know while they're watching tv or something and you're Aww. seeing all of these little toddlers you know from the age of and well there's my whole thing like well there why is this one-year-old like sitting in front of the tv but whatever <laughs> you know the parent you know lays their head in their lap and just kind of like pretends to be watching and every single one that i've seen so far the child you know they're ranging from like one to three maybe four mm -hmm. they grab that parent's head Oh. They turn it towards them. They're kissing their mom oh, they, or dad right. and whoever lays down. And it's like, no one taught them that. Right. But you can right. you can kind of see, like, that's how the parent yep. interacts with their child. And so yep. their child just instinctively does that. Even though, yep. you know, the head, their parent's head is, like, the size yep. of them. It's the cutest thing you should. I don't know <laughs> no, if your kids are into it. TikTok. And I'm, you know, I have They're to be because my I, students. Yeah, but. <laughs> and I'm not either. But I do know what it is. And I know what you're talking about. Now yeah. I'm going to be intrigued to go check yeah, I think it was just out. like a YouTube video and I saw it on Facebook, but it is the cutest thing. And it's just like, how do these kids know to do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like, it was so yep. cute. Yeah. So cute. So I think what happens is that most of us are, ha, do have an innate capacity for empathy. And then what happens to us in terms of our early experiences either magnifies that or dampens it mm -hmm. and it can always test to answer your question it can always be fostered again through through healthy relationships through therapy through mindfulness through compassion through mm -hmm. you know but if we have but if we all had that foundation wouldn't it be just so much easier and and that's why you know the this the social emotional learning curriculums being adopted by schools is you know exciting and promising in terms of not just teaching academics but mm -hmm. also really considering that that emotion is something that we need to be talking about preach in right yes yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely and the research is very clear on that that the you know when we've taken these programs into schools mm -hmm. they're wildly successful molly we're so. gonna have to like have a follow-up interview and where you and i can go into like the yes. schools <laughs> yes um oh yeah that'll be a fun one mm -hmm. i'm already i'm already scheduling thank you all for yeah. tuning into the first part of our incredible three-part series with dr countermine on part two of the series, we will be diving more into the difference between empathy and sensitivity, unearthing compassion, becoming a beacon of change, discussing the shift between empathy and apathy, as well as answering the question of if it's too late to change in life, plus a whole lot more. If you enjoyed this episode or the show, please feel free to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, as well as drop a comment. So thank you again and stay tuned for the next part of the series.